thank you to the Objectives Club and to the uh, MPA Council for inviting me. And thank you all. Uh, thank you all for being here. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, it is a little bit of. Uh, it, it, it's kind of cool. It's about 20 years since I graduated. From the United so just as young as I was. Back. <laughs> if you believe that. So shrugging, shrugging the stigma of success. This is a title I didn't come up with, and you know, we'll have to figure out if I actually deliver on the title. You'll have to tell me at the end. But uh, we're gonna we're gonna uh, uh, talk about success, particularly in the context. What I want to talk about is success in the context of business. We're in a business school. Many of you, hopefully, are business students, or some of you are business students, and yet there is this issue that I think we face within the society we live. If you're an athlete and you sign a $100 million contract, uh, whether you live up to that contract or don't live up to that contract, everybody's going to cheer you when you sign the contract. And if you don't live up to it, everybody's going to shrug and say, well, they made a bad deal. Who cares? Tough. But it, it, it's never a big deal. It never gets uh, moral passions engaged. You know, I, I'm a Red Sox fan, and the Red Sox signed this Japanese pitcher once, right? And they paid $50 million to the Japanese club, and they paid him $50 million. And he thought he was going to be a superstar. Right? And he was okay, but he wasn't worth $100 million. There was no press about this. I mean, the sports writers wrote a little bit. But think what happens when a CEO gets paid $100 million. Particularly if it turns out after the fact, that he didn't perform, that he wasn't that good. I mean, the world's in. Everybody's in a pool. Everybody is shocked. And how could this be? And it's not their money, right? Any more than it's their money when a pitcher gets paid $100 million. Yet, society somehow finds this offensive. Generally, we have a special attitude in, in our culture towards business and businessmen. And it goes something like this. We kind of admire them. We respect them. And we resent them and hate them at the same time. So take somebody like Bill Gates. I mean, everybody wants to be Bill Gates. Everybody admired what Bill Gates did when he did it. And yet, many people, many people, were kind of happy when the Justice Department went after him. Uh, they, can, they, they resent the amount of wealth that he had and has. When he was running Microsoft, what are people's general attitude towards Bogues? Positive, negative? I mean, again, positive in the sense that he succeeded in business, but as a human being, as a, as a, as a man, right? As a moral creature. In terms of morality, in moral terms, what did we think of Bogues? Positive, negative? I mean, Put him on a scale, I don't know, who's the, who, who would you consider, like, a culture considers a moral hero? Somebody who's noble and just and good and virtuous. Well, that is Teresa. Perfect. If you, if you had said it, I would. <laughs> so here's Mother Teresa. Where's Bill Gates? Okay. I mean, in terms of our moral thinking, in terms of the language that we think about, Bill Gates is way down here. Right? If we think about him in moral terms at all, it's at best morally neutral because we don't think or we don't think in terms of business as moral or immoral and at worst it's negative because he's got 70 billion dollars how can that be right right there are a lot of people who don't have anything so from the perspective of morality we view it as negative and yet who do you think more who did more to help other people Bill Gates or other Teresa? Who impacted more lives? Positively impacted more lives. I mean, it's not even close. <laughs> Who hasn't been? Now, you guys, a lot of you are too young to remember when Microsoft dominated the world, right? But who on the planet has not been impacted by Microsoft in <coughs> one way or another, directly or indirectly? I'm not even talking about the wealth that was created, the jobs that were created, and not just jobs at Microsoft, jobs at all the suppliers. <laughs> All the companies that use Microsoft products, all the people. I mean, it's endless number. But then, all of us use Microsoft products. It's changed our lives. 
And millions and billions of people use Microsoft Cloud. So he is a businessman who has impacted every human being on the planet, but gets zero moral credit for it, or indeed, in many cases, negative moral credit. Right? He's perceived negative. And he has a woman, you know, she helped some people, she prevented some people from dying of starvation in India. Well, she didn't really. No, no, she did. She just didn't. She didn't do anything to help them rise up above their poverty, but she, did, she didn't prevent them from dying. She believed the meek shall inherit the earth, and therefore you wanted meek people around. And she didn't. She, no, it's true. If you read about her, Christopher Hitchens wrote a, a brilliant book on, on Mother Teresa. And uh, I mean, the whole philosophy there is poor people are virtuous by the very nature of the fact that they're poor. So you want to have lots of poor people. So you don't want to encourage them to learn. To, to, to work hard, to rise up into the middle class group, because then they become less virtuous. What you want is them to stay poor. So she would help them not die, but she wouldn't help them go about that. But that is, that she considered a hero. Now, why is she considered a moral hero in Bogetna? What did she get out of it? I mean, again, what, nothing. Or, or indeed, a perception is that she suffered, right? And if you read Hitchens' book again, or if you read Mother Teresa's diary, she actually did. She hated what she was doing. She continuously uh, believed that God had left her and that she wasn't, there was, she wasn't sure that there was a God. I mean, she was a miserable human being, it turns out. Um, but that suffering gives her mobility. It gives her actions mobility in our common perception. Bill Gates, what did he get out of it? $70 billion. Right? <laughs> so how can that be more? So morality in the culture we live in is not about what somebody does for other people. It's about what? Whether you get anything out of it or not. Whether you get anything out of it or not. And if you get a lot out of it, and the perception at least is that other people are not much better off, then it's neg then you're negative. Now, why is this true of what's the difference between um, Bill Gates and an athlete. Because an athlete gets $100 million and we're fine with it. But Bill Gates gets $100 million and we're... What's the difference? They use others' skills and attributes. And different skills, but why can we associate more with athletic no, skills? and resources. They use oh, other different resources. Other people, yes. So one... Is, is using other people in order to attain a goal, and one, it's, it's his individual skill, you can see it. And I, I think the fundamental difference there is that one is perceptual. When an athlete is great, you can see it. Right? Because it's you and him, and you can see him, and you've shot a basketball, right? Everybody shot a basketball. We know how pathetic we are. <laughs> and then we see Michael Jordan do it, or oh, who's the guy today? I've been told not to use Michael Jordan anymore, LeBron. These young people don't use Michael Jordan. <laughs> LeBron James does it. You know, oh, wow, I can't do that. That that, and that's fun to watch, right? So you get a certain so sense. Somebody, somebody else paid him a hundred million dollars. That's fine. I'm getting to enjoy this, right? This is fun. Bill Gates. How many of you have managed a large corporation? How many of you have managed a small one? Very few of you, right? I mean, the skill set, what it takes to do, is not something within most of our experience. We have no knowledge of what it takes to be a businessman, what it takes to create, what it takes to build wealth. And we also are somewhat removed from the benefit. And we're not taught, we're not taught the benefit that they get. Indeed, I think we're taught often the opposite. So when you buy a Microsoft product, are you better off for having bought it? I mean, if you pay a hundred bucks for, I don't know, something, Windows, right? how much is it worth you? hundred bucks. No. <laughs> more than a lot. <laughs> how much is it worth to you? If you paid a hundred bucks, how much is it worth to you? More. More than a hundred bucks. If it was worth a hundred bucks, you wouldn't bother, right? You were indifferent. You would be indifferent between the money in your pocket and the product over there. The reason you buy it is because it's worth more than a hundred bucks to you, you think. You might be wrong, but you go into the transaction assuming that the utility you get from the product is greater than $100. And how much is the product worth at Microsoft? Less, Less than $100. They've made something off of it, right? So both parties have won. 
The nature of a treaty, the nature of a voluntary treaty is win-win. But most people don't think of it that way. Most of it don't think, most people don't think of a wow, my life is so much better off because of Microsoft. We don't, nobody talks about it, nobody thinks in those terms. And indeed, conceptually, you know, if, if most people, if they don't really think about it, the fact that Steve Bill Gates has $70 billion, what does that mean about me? I have $70 billion less. Or we have $70 billion less. So unless you understand the win-win nature of trade, <laughs> unless you understand that it is we're both better off after the transaction, we're both better off after the transaction, then unless you understand that, then his wealth is perceived by me to be at my expense. Or at our expense, at somebody's expense. And of course, our teachers again teach that this is the whole exploitation Marxist theory of how the world works, which is still in sneaky different ways in our curriculum and in our media and in the way people relate ideas about business to all of us. So, the athlete, we see the benefit to us, and we accept it. And most of us watch it on television, so we never actually, we think we never pay for it. We pay for it in the, the marketing costs, and the goods, and in the products, and I mean, we pay for it, but it's so small, we don't feel like we pay for it. Right? Versus the businessman, the skill set is a skill set that's foreign to us. We don't understand it, we don't know it. I mean, anybody could do that job. I had... Uh, I was on, uh, let me take this off, it's hot in here. It's Austin. Um, <laughs> I was on Bill O'Reilly's show in 2002. If you remember all the scandals around Enron and WorldCon, all those stuff. And Bill O'Reilly, he's a populist. He's a typical put your figure out into the wind and test where the, where the mood of the country is. Bill O'Reilly wanted to fire every CEO in America that day. Every CEO had to be fired. And I was there to defend CEOs. And his attitude was, Anybody can do their job. What do they do? It's a big deal. And there's a certain element that people sympathize with that. They, you know, they don't understand what a CEO does. They don't understand what it takes to be a CEO, the complexity, the skill set, the need. The, the, and therefore, $100 million or $70 billion in the case of Bill Gates, how can that ever be just? Where's the value at? What do I get from? I don't see it. I don't understand it. And it all looks like a zero-sum world. And I'd be told that if somebody's making a lot of money, it's at my expense. And I, here it's obvious because I'm not getting any benefit, or at least I can't see it. People, in order to gain an appreciation for the CEO, step one has to be, they have to be conceptual. They have to think, which is a challenge. Everybody thinks. And they have to think about it right. They have, to be, they have to understand the nature of both business, and it's our job as students of business, people who are out there as, as business leaders, which I think they don't do. Businessmen never go out and explain what it is that they do and defend themselves. The nature of the business and the value that is actually being created. The value that's actually being created. Through win-win transactions, business is what builds the world around us. Nothing, none of the stuff that we have in our modern society today would exist without profit-seeking businesses. None of them. And yet a businessman proud of this? Proud of their achievements? Well, I attended, uh, I attended a um, awards dinner, or awards lunch in uh, Charleston, South Carolina. She can't accuse us of being a bunch of liberals because it was Charleston, South Carolina. And... <laughs> They, had a, they, they, they were giving people Lifetime Achievement Awards, business leaders and community Lifetime Achievement Awards. And, you know, and they, they read these long biographies as you, know, as you would expect at such an important event. And of the 10 minutes that they spent on their biographies, they probably spent one and a half on their business achievements and eight and a half on their community service and charity. Same Mother Teresa Bill Gates thing, right? The community service and charity. Yet, even from the perspective of how many people you touch out there, how many people you 
help. Where do you touch more people? In your community service, charity, or in your business? Clearly in your business. Clearly in your business. And yet they're ashamed of it. They're embarrassed by it. Not only don't they go out and defend themselves, they actually retrench. They actually feel bad about it. They actually feel guilty. When they should feel immense proud of the values they create, of the world that we have. Whether it's the concrete that went into the walls of these, you know, these uh, things for the, in, in the, in the, this, uh, tiles. I was a civil engineer once. Like, you know, in, the, in the tiles of, of the ceiling, all of this, everything, the, the, what is this plastic type of floor, the tables, the iPhones, I'm not even getting into all the technology that you guys are playing with while I speak. Um, <laughs> but all of that is created by business, by business, by profit-seeking businesses. And yet, what they're proud of is the few hours they do a week in community or charity or the, do the checks they write up. It's something very, very perverse. And it's sad in terms of what these guys have actually made, what these guys and gals have actually produced. And yet, they have a certain degree of guilt, of shame, in that. Why? So part of it is that people don't understand, that people don't get it, because there's a certain complexity to what it is about business. But what, what else is it? What else is it about being profitable, being, being business, that makes people feel ashamed, that makes people feel guilty? What is business about? Greed. Yeah, it's about greed in a sense, right? Let's not. It's about what? It's about profit. Is it only about profit? It's about making money, right? It's about selling stuff and making a profit on that. Is it only about making money? What else is it about? It's about ambition. Pride. Pride. It's about pride. It can be about pride. Happiness. Happiness. Why? Why happiness? Your whole activity is doing your whole reason is yeah, to make your a, life better. Yeah, it's about being engaged in something that's fulfilling, something fun, something engaging. I mean, Steve Jobs cared about profit when he made these, right? Because they had 60% profit margins. If he cared about meat, he would have sold it a lot cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> but it wasn't just about that. I mean, he loved this stuff, right? He loved the vision of it, the beauty of it, the, the creating something and seeing it in reality out there. But all of it was about whom? It's about Steve Jobs, right? It's about Steve Jobs' profit, Steve Jobs' vision, Steve Jobs' beautiful stuff. It's about Steve Jobs. Business is about the business owners, and hopefully the employees, but the business owners' self-fulfillment. It's about him. It's about self. It's about self-interest. But I like to tell the joke, some of you might have heard it, that when I went to buy this 2008 economy spiraling out of control, and I wanted to buy my first iPhone because I wanted to stimulate the US economy. <laughs> <laughs> because I know that you guys go to the mall. Why do you go to the mall? To, to make sure people have jobs. <laughs> You're all good Keynesians, and you believe that consumption drives the economy, so you go and consume because you want to have a live in a prosperous country, right? Anybody? <laughs> um, oh, you go to the mall, why? To consume your? Self-interest. But what do we know about self-interest? It's bad. Very bad. It's bad. <laughs> right? Mother Teresa wasn't self-interested. At least that's not what we're told. And her diaries seem to suggest that that was true. Right? Self-interest is not morally good. It's not morally noble. It's not morally right. It's actually the opposite. Every one of our philosophers Every one of our religious leaders will tell us that the purpose of morality is sacrifice, it's doing for others, it's being selfless, right? Selflessness is the essence of the good, of the moral, of the noble, selflessness. I mean, my mother taught me, good Jewish household, think of yourself last, think of others first. Now, she didn't mean it. Nobody actually means this stuff. <laughs> Not in your, for your own kids. But that's what we've been taught to say. That's what we believe morality is about. Even though we don't live it, now what happens? 
When you believe something to be good, to be noble, to be right, to be just, but you live differently. What, what, what does that create? Guilt. Guilt. It's exactly what guilt is all about. Right? We're taught. My mother taught me, be selfless. Think of yourself last. Think of others first. But then I think of myself first. What did I say about my mother taught me that that was good? But I don't want to do that. So I'll write a check. <laughs> right? It's called giving back. I mean, they, they get their, uh, some low, uh, you know, their mother's a little happy enough. Right? They feel like but they know that doesn't matter. And, and you see this all over the place. You don't just see it, and literally they're writing a check. You see it in the community service and the charity, which they feel obliged to do. And I'm not against community service. I'm not against charity. I'm not against writing a check. But it's the motivation. Note the motivation. The motivation is to appease a form of guilt that I'll get to in a minute. I don't think it's earned. Right? It's unearned guilt. So they do all this stuff to... Reduce the burden, and of course you can never do enough. Because the fact is we all still live our lives you know, on a day-to-day -day basis. Pursuing stuff for us. Perceivably selfish. And yet we've got we live in this quandary. We live in this in this world of guilt. And you see it, you see it when you talk to businessmen. You see how they vote. I mean, guilt is a you know, just ask you know, ask any um, Catholic or Jewish mother. Guilt is a terrific means to control people. Because <laughs> you can get them to do something that they wouldn't otherwise do. It's not in their self. So, rich people, how do rich people vote? Right? Everybody thinks that uh, people vote based on their pocketbook. People vote uh, will, will be good for their, their economic. Right? So, if I promise to raise your taxes, you won't vote. Right? That's the typical theory of voting out there. And yet, it's completely untrue. So Obama ran this campaign promising to increase taxes on the rich. And there was every reason to believe his promise. He would increase taxes on the rich. So how do you think the rich voted? What do you want? Against Obama. Against Obama, right? You would think. <laughs> Eight of the ten richest counties in the United States voted for Obama. For Obama. And you can't just say it's cronyism. Because... Silicon Valley is not crony, right? Maybe the counties are out DC, right? Mm -hmm. right? This isn't this isn't cronyism. They voted because it's guilt. Yeah, I'm not giving enough. I haven't given back enough. So you raise my taxes, I give more. In California, we just raise taxes on rich people. Uh, anybody owning more than two hundred fifty thousand, which in California is not that rich, um, raise it by thirty percent, from ten percent to thirteen percent. <laughs> Big taxing, how did the rich vote? For them. Or for what we? For them. People don't vote their pocket. People vote what they think is right. And they think it's right for them to be taxed more because they feel guilty about what they the money they make. So a whole the whole moral code of the society in which we live is built around the idea that self-interest is negative. Because what does self-interest entail? What are we taught from when this speak that self-interest entail? When you call the kid in the playground, oh, you're selfish, what did you mean? He takes care of himself, which is what selfish literally means. No, what did you mean? That he's what? He won't share. Not he won't share. But it's worse than that. Not only he won't to share, he's going to take your toys <laughs> if he wants to, right? The whole perception of selfish is that you'll exploit others, you'll take advantage of others, you'll steal, lie, cheat, you'll do whatever it takes to get away with stuff. Right? You'll get your way no matter how. So we're presented in ethics, we're presented with two versions of ethics. You can either be Mother Teresa, sacrifice your life for the sake of others and do nothing for your own good, right? or you are lying, stealing, SOB. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. There's no other alternative in morality, right? And yet there is. And yet there is. Right? Because being self-interested doesn't require lying, stealing, cheating, and being an SOB. Indeed, I would argue that none of those characteristics are actually in your self-interest. That life doesn't reward any of those activities. It actually penalizes them. And particularly in business. 
So think about what it takes to build and run a successful business over the long term. Because being self-interested means taking care of yourself. Now, does taking care of myself mean just tomorrow? If I'm dedicating my life to taking care of myself, does that mean just tomorrow? I'm going to live a certain life. Yeah, 40 years, I've still got, maybe. <laughs> 40, right? It doesn't just mean tomorrow, it means every one of these years. There's no point in my doing something tomorrow that five years from now is just going to collapse my life out. I value tomorrow more than I value 40 years from now. Why is that? It's basic finance, right? <laughs> because tomorrow, you know, probability of me being actually alive tomorrow is high. Probability of me being alive in 40 years lower. Right? <laughs> a lot of, there's a lot of uncertainty about what's going to happen 40 years from now. I know about tomorrow. But I still value myself if I'm going to live 40 years. That's why we save, or some people say, <coughs> used to say, um, when we're incentivized not to. Because I do care about 40 years from now. So somebody self-interested cares about his life, his whole life, not just about tomorrow. So if you're in business, if you're trying to build a business, does it pay to lie? Long term, does it pay in the moment? Sometimes, in the sense that you might get stuff that you wouldn't otherwise. Does it pay long term? Not the cost of your reputation. Yeah, I mean, if you're in a business and you're known as a liar, nobody does business with you. Nobody deals with you. If you lie enough, you land up in jail. Um, if you lie to your employees, who's going to want to work for you? People are not going to want to work for you. You know, liars don't succeed in business. Uh, a great example of this is, is uh, Bodhi Madoff. Anybody know Bodhi Madoff? Is? <laughs> Bodhi Never know. Um, Bodhi is in jail, right? He was caught. And he's recently been interviewed, and he said he's happier in jail than he was before he was caught. <laughs> and I believe it. Because Bernie made off lie to everybody. His best friends, his family, the people around him. He said he was terrified constantly of being caught. Not by the police. By his wife, by his kids. You know who turned him in in there? His kids. His sons. And one of his sons committed suicide a year after he turned him in. I mean, this is devastating, even for somebody as corrupt and horrible like Bernie Madoff. Lying doesn't work if you care about yourself, if you care about your own life long term. Cheating, stealing, none of those strategies in business work. I mean, again, they might work for instant gratification in the moment, but they don't work. No successful businessman in a, in a, in a free market, you know, granted. If it's regulated and controlled, you never know. But in a free model, is successful after a lifetime of lying and stealing and cheating. It's not a strategy for success in business. It's quite the contrary. When somebody's done phenomenally well in business, what can you say about them? What have they been? What's that? Successful. Successful, but, but what can you say about the attributes that led to success? <laughs> If you look at, and you can look at any book, you can look at, uh, and, you know, any of these business success books, they all basically boil down to the same kind of stuff in terms of successful businessmen describing what led them to be successful. And I don't know any, any business book that presents, okay, the way to make money is to be a lying, cheating thief, or the way to make money is to be an SOB. <laughs> Nobody writes that because it's not true. The guys who are actually successful are not any of them. They're being self-interested, but self-interest requires them to do what? What are the solid characteristics of a successful business? They solve the problem? Yeah, be problem solver, right? Be rational. And be rational means deal with facts, deal with reality. Don't deal with lies. You know, lies distort. This is an important tool. This is a crucial tool for your survival in business and in life. This is, this is what it's all about. Your ability to reason, your ability to think. Lies is a corrupting mechanism for this. You know, there's a, a saying in, in uh, computer, computers, garbage in, garbage out. Well, it's the same in here. You put in garbage in here, you'll get garbage. In business, you put in bad facts, you'll be a lousy business person. In life, general, this is true. How many of you 
Well, they see the message. But how many of you have lied? Um, <laughs> I mean, even in your personal life, it's a it's a lousy strategy. It just it, it, you often get caught. If you don't get caught, you have to lie many times. It complicates relationships. It complicates your life. It's it's hard work. Reality is so much easier. You know, and at my age, I can barely remember what happened last week. What actually happened? This is true. Right? Now, if I lie about it, I have to remember two things. The fact and the lie. But actually, it's more than two things. Because I have to remember the fact and the lie, and who I told the fact to, who I told the lie to. But it's more than that even, because I have to remember why I told them the lie. It's way too much work for me. It's so much easier just to tell the truth, because you have to remember only one thing. The truth. And if you forget you told somebody that, it's not a problem because the only thing you tell people is the one thing that actually happened. So it's easy. So that, oh, am I lying to this person this week or not? <laughs> that time. And that's true again. Business, life, it's all the same. The same basic principles. So they had to be problem solvers. They had to be used the mind. They had to be rational. What else would come out of these books in terms of business success? Disciplined and persistent. Yeah, they had to be hardworking, disciplined. Uh, productive. They had to be, you know, had a focus, incredibly focused on the end result. And, you know, these people work incredibly hard. If you read about Bill Gates or Steve Jobs or, or any of these successful businesses in any industry, they don't reach that top unless they're incredibly hardworking and productive. You know, they're focused, single mindedly focused on being successful in this. And they love it. They love it. If you meet a successful businessman, they almost always love what it is that they're doing. They enjoy it, unless they get the widow with guilt about it. They have integrity. Yeah, they have integrity. They do what they say they're going to do. Right? They live up to their, their own standards that they've set. They live, and that's important for their employees, it's important for their suppliers, it's important for their customers. What else? They're rational, they're productive, they have integrity. They're, yeah, they're long range thinkers, which is related to being rational, right? They think long range, they're not just in the moment. They're not just about getting away with stuff. And the ones who are about getting away with stuff are the ones who commit the fraud, who have problems, who go to jail. If you go back to WorldCom and some of those, a lot of what happened with it was not that, and this is true of most business fraud, it's not that they sat down one day and said, huh, how can I cheat my shareholders and customers out of millions of dollars in my pockets? WorldCom is a good example. It's not what happened. What happened was they had earnings below market expectations. I said, oh, you know, I don't feel like reporting the lower. And next quarter will be much better. I'll just this time, one time, one time, I'll just, it wasn't even going into their pockets. I'll just, you know, fake the number this one time. And of course, the next month, it's down, but it's even worse. And now they have to fake a lot more. And soon, you know, you're faking billions and billions of dollars. Or the guy in Singapore who, you know, brought down uh, Bearings Bank, right? The same thing. He, he, he made a an investment in, um, in the Nikkei, and it went south, and he lost $100 million, and instead of reporting that he lost $100 million, that they would have been pissed off at him, they would have given him a little slap on the wrist. Instead of that, he felt really bad, so he doubled up. He said, you know, it doesn't go down two days in a row. And of course, it did, he lost again, and doubled up. And, it, and soon enough, I think it was 2 or $3 billion that he lost, and he landed up in jail in Singapore. Not a pleasant thing. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. Jail in Singapore, not good. What's that? Haynes. Yeah, canings. That's, I think, yeah. Canings for chewing gum. <laughs> Imagine what they do for losing $3 billion. <laughs> right. So, you want to be a long term thinker because short term thinking gets you in trouble. It'll get you in trouble. And, and, you know, just think of the technology world right now. Think about what happens if you don't think long term in the technology world we live in today when things are changing so quickly. It, and if you latch on just on the short-term thing and you forget the long-term, I mean, you're likely to lose in the technology game today anyway, even if you're really, really good. But to be to really be successful, you have to have a vision. You have to know where you're going. I mean, Steve Jobs was working on projects years and years into the future. I mean, he had a vision for the product line. It wasn't just something tomorrow to, to send someone out there and seems to respond to anything Apple does, right? So it's, it's, it's more of a sponsor thing. But they've, of course, been incredibly successful. They do it very, very well. 
when they do it. They know who to copy. That's, that's a skill set as well. Not everybody knows that. There's still a company out there trying to copy Blackberry. <laughs> so you have to be rational. You have to have integrity. You have to be productive. You have to be honest. We talked about honesty. Anything else? You just mentioned it actually. They have to believe very strongly in what it is that they're doing. Yeah, you have to believe in what you're doing. You have to have a passion about it. You have to love what you do. You have to love what you do. And you have to be doing it for whom? You have to do it, be doing it for yourself. I mean, that's, you know, business is about self-interest. And I don't know a businessman who go out there and, I want to maximize social utility. So I'm going to get into, I mean, there's no, nobody gets motivated. I mean, they might have the illusion that they're doing it that way, but they, they want to do it because they love it, because it makes them feel good. It has to be internal. It has to come from them. So it has to be self-motivated, be, be, be selfish in a really deep sense, to be, to be incredibly successful. Again, because they work incredibly hard. This is not easy stuff. This is not fun and games. If you read Steve Jobs' biography, you know this, right? I mean, these were difficult decisions to make, difficult challenges, failure, often failure, learn from that failure, you know, rise up to the challenge. Uh, these are, this is hard, hard work. So you better love what you're doing. You have to be, you have to, how do you treat employees? Be a good business. Good business. All your customers, all your suppliers. How, how would you treat employees? You know, I used to, when I used to, uh, when I used to teach, I used to do this little exercise uh, with my students. And we used to, you know, there's this idea of uh, stakeholder capitalism. Yeah. Where you're the CEO, you really care about all the stakeholders equally. You're not maximizing shareholder law. You, actually, you, you care about all stakeholders. So you, I used to make a list of all the stakeholders. Right? And there are a lot of them. You can imagine lots of them. And then you have a decision, a corporate decision. You move a plan to Mexico or not to move. Okay, is it good for the stakeholder, not good for the stakeholder? You put a plus or minus next day to one of them. And, go, da, 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 da. and you get a, a board with lots of pluses and lots of minuses. Okay, make a decision. <laughs> and what does that boil down to? How do you make a decision at the end of the day if you're trying to do that? It's called politics. Whoever's got the biggest voice, who's ever got the biggest stick, he's the one who's going to get his way. On the other hand, companies only maximize shareholder, shareholder work. So all they care about is shareholders. They don't care about anybody else. So when it comes to, then we go with the stakeholders. So for example, when it comes to the employees, they chain them to the machines and they work them three times a day. Because they don't care about the employees. All they care about is shareholders. And the students go, oh, well, wait a minute. We do care about the employees. They produce the stuff. We want them to be productive. So we have to treat them. Well, why? Because we want to maximize our shareholder wealth, right? But we need to treat employees well. We need to treat our customers well. So how do we treat them? Well, what's another word for well in this context? Justly. Justly. You need to treat them with justice, right? You need to treat them based on what they deserve, which means what? What they work for. Yeah, how much, what they work for, how much they work towards. How productive they are. What's their value to the enterprise? And that's true of our employees, but that's true of our suppliers, our customers, you want to be guided by a justice, by a sense of what's just, what's right. You're not there to exploit, because we talked about all, these are all hopefully win-win relationships. You want them to produce. This is a cooperative activity business. So you treat them with justice based on what they deserve. So again, the mythology of business, right? Short term, particularly American business are considered short term. It's always weird to me that we're the only country that invests in biotech, and yet we're short term. <laughs> Biotech's like a 15 year investment horizon, right? To, to, to see any returns. Um, more R&D in this country than anywhere else in the world. We're short term, we exploit, we treat people badly, all of this stuff, and yet that's not what business is actually about. It's being rational, which means being long term. It's being just. It's being honest. It's having integrity. It's caring with a passion about what the product you do and what you care for. And lastly, I'll just mention it's about being proud. It's this is the the, the, the caring, right? It's being proud about what you want to do, by wanting to be really good at, it, by wanting to attain excellence, by striving to be the best that you can be. You know, successful businessmen. That's what it's about. So, 
if you think about business, the, the picture that is painted in the culture about business is so distorted and perverted. And this is why we have this negative attitude towards them. It's why we treat them so badly, you know, the PR perspective. You know, over half the murders on TV and on movies are committed by businessmen. <laughs> over half. You know how many murders in real life are committed by businessmen? Very few. Who, who commits most of the murders in real life? Well, <laughs> yes. Most likely you hit the by people in your own family or peer group. Yeah, yeah that's true. And it's just a professional criminals tend to be, but that doesn't make good TV. But have a rich guy do it, that makes great TV. Because again, we associate all these negative attributes, and yet none of those att negative attributes are real in terms of what it really takes to be a successful business. So being self-interested, being self-interested in the proper sense is about those attributes. To be a success in business, <coughs> to be truly self-interested qua businessman, means to have those attributes. Those are not about lying, cheating, stealing. They're, but they're not about self-sacrifice. And Rand's argument, Ayn Rand's argument, is that that is what the real self-interest is. What selfishness really means is it means being rational being just, being honest, being productive, having integrity, having pride. That's what real self-interest, not the lying, stealing, cheat. That's, my term for that is self-destructive, because I think all of those behaviors are self-destructive in business and in life. But that the real alternative to living for other people, being selfless and so on, that nobody wants, and really is a pretty crummy morality if you think about it. You only live once. Why would you live for other people? They like better than yours, more important than yours. Why? How did that come about? Right. Um, that there is a real alternative, and that alternative is you. You know this morality of self-interest, which I think powers achievers, powers success, but they don't know it. They don't know that they're being moral because nobody talks about morality in those terms. When we talk about morality, again, we talk about it in terms of selflessness. So they feel guilty, even though they're rational and you know, successful and productive and honest and have integrity and all these things. They don't associate any of those terms with morality. What they associate with morality is selflessness. They're not that. They feel guilty. And to me, that guilt is what is causing our drift away from capitalism. To me, that guilt is what is moving our society away from free markets. And what causes these businessmen to take pride in their community service and not in their business achievement. I mean, I like to tell them, you know, America was founded in 1776, third rate colony, the British barely cared about us. They didn't really fight. That's why we won, right? <laughs> By 1914, the United States was the strongest economic power on the face of the earth. By far. I mean, we entered World War One. it was over until we ended it. Still. So militarily, economically, the most powerful. 130, 40 years, right? And we achieved that because of community service and character? <laughs> no, we achieved that because of profit-seeking business. Because people went out there and built stuff and created stuff. And that's why, you know, we, we created a middle class, the poor rose up and, and, and established a, a life. So how many people were poor? Uh, in in 1700, as a percent, basically all of them. So 95 percent, 99 percent of the population was poor. Right? And then there were some aristocrats. If you look, there's a there's a famous chart of uh, wealth per capita, wealth per capita in human history. And uh, I'll go in there. 10,000 years ago, over here. Okay, so this is wealth per capita in human history, and this is where it goes like this. And then it goes like this. And it, when, when does it turn? I like to say 1776. <laughs> Two things happened in 1776. Founding of America, what's the second one? Well, well, the World of Nations is published. So whether it's 1776 or not, it's symbolically 1776. That's what happened. And that's business. That's capitalism. That's freedom. That's free markets. That's what generates that. And yet we're rejecting them, in my view, because of this 
dual model, this, this false model code that we uphold, which is destroying our perception of business and free markets and capitalism. So if we want capitalism, if we want you know, to, to, to be self-fulfilled as business leaders, which those of you business students hopefully do, you want to be successful, you want to feel good about yourself being successful, then what you need to reject is this morality of selflessness. And adopt this morality, I man's moral, moral code, a morality of self-interest, a morality of egoism, but not the false self-interest, the false egoism of that our philosophers teach us that exists, you know, that of lying, stealing, and cheating, but a morality of production, of rationality, of integrity, pride, independence, that morality. And that will lead to success in business and life. And will lead to a sense of pride about your real achievements, not the pseudo achievements. Thank you all. Yeah, um, we're going to have a brief or however long it needs to be question and answer period. So if you have a question, just raise your hand. You know, one of the things that I think we take some pride in is the fact that American society is incredibly charitable. There's a lot of charitable giving. And I don't know if the conclusion is that we're doing it because we're guilty or because we're, we're good people. What, what's your sense on that? So my sense is that a lot of it is done out of a sense of guilt. I believe, it, and if, if you go back into the 19th century, where we were free, where there was, where there was very little taxation, uh, uh, government spending during the 19th century, total government spending, state, local, federal, was, you know, maxed out at like 7%. Right? So federal spending was about 4% and the rest was about 3 Today, we're over 40 Just to give you a sense of the role of government and the level of taxation, which, which would result as a consequence. People are far more charitable and far more generous during the 19th century than they are even today. I think some of that was motivated by guilt, but I think a lot of that was motivated by benevolence, by just a benevolence towards other, other people. And I think, I think that a freer world, an egoistic world, a world in which we didn't feel this guilt, would be a charitable world. Now, it wouldn't be indiscriminately charitable. Some people don't deserve charity. It would be a discriminating charity. But I, I don't believe that people who value their own life, who want to live a successful, prosperous, happy life, you know, want there to be segments of the population that truly suffer. Now, I also think that those segments are small. The fact is you don't need much charity. Because the way in which you help most people is by giving them a job, and that's not help, it's a trade. So if you create enough jobs, think of, again, think of a 19th century America. It started out with a very small population in America and absorbed millions and millions of immigrants. And they all found jobs. Unemployment rates in the 19th century were very low. And they absorbed these immigrants and jobs were created because the economy was free. Unemployment, in my view, is a consequence of statism. It's not a consequence of markets. So in capitalism, the way in which you're helping the poor and the way we're helping most people is the fact that there are jobs available to them. And therefore, the number of people who need help is small. And charity is plentiful. So, I think there's a, there's a, there's a, there are two elements driving charity. Benevolence, which I think is a positive element, which I think is a good element. We, we, you know, I have respect for any human being unless it proves otherwise. Right? But everybody's a potential trader. This is why, in my view, more people on the planet, the better. Right? The more people on the planet, the more people I can trade with. The more win-win relationships I have, right? The better off we all are. So I don't buy this. Oh, we can't go over eleven billion or six billion or whatever. Um, no, the more the better. We'll figure out what to do with them as they come. Right? Um, so there's a there's a certain benevolence towards other human beings. I mean, think about how we take care of our pets. How we take care of plants. We don't let plants just die. You water them. You take care of them. These are human beings. They're much more valuable than a pet or a plant. So there's an element, but then I think a lot of it is driven by guilt, and therefore it's misguided often. So a lot of people give to charities. I, let's take Bill Gates, for example. Bill Gates lives in Seattle. His kids go to school in that area. They can grow up in that area. Yet 
When he gives, he's giving in Africa. Now my view is, the reason he gives to Africa is to distance the giving as much as possible from his own self-interest. It's a perception type of thing. Right? There's a lot of work to be done in Seattle. I mean, I don't know if you've ever seen the show The Killing. It's pretty brutal. But it's, it's, it, it's, it's filmed in Seattle, and this last season's episodes were all about these kids who live in the streets in Seattle and the horrific conditions under which they live. These are kids who run away from home because they've got abusive parents or something. And they live in these houses. Yeah, Bill Gates is money. You could help these kids. Really help these kids. They, they don't have shelters because there's not enough shelters and things like that. He puts his money in Africa because he wants to be, to be perceived as moral, as virtuous. He has to distance himself from the result as much as possible. I like to say, you know, people still don't trust Bill Gates because he seems to be having fun giving his money away. <laughs> for him to become a saint, for us to no, no. no. It's true. But for him to be perceived as like Mother Teresa, what would he have to do? You're like, really miserable. Yeah, yeah, he'd have to give up all this money, move into a tent, and if he could bleed a little bit, you know, <laughs> then we'd say, wow, nobody would want to be here. But everybody would say, wow, now there's somebody committed to his values and virtues. Right? So we have this, this false view of. of how we do our charity, I think our charity would be more effective, would be more focused, would be focused on what we care about rather than dispersed. Um, I just think, I just think if, 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 you, if, if people brought the same self-interest that they bring to their business, into their charity work, it would be more successful. And there is a movement right now, what's it called, the um, entrepreneurial, social entrepreneurs or something like that, where people are trying to approach Charity, like a business, and you know, I don't think it's all motivated by good things, but it, but it's a, it's a, it's a more of an approach to charity that is focused on, you know, real values versus appeasing you. Yeah. I think maybe there's a fundamental problem with the way that's out. No, I don't like that. <laughs> so I guess. Um, my viewpoint is from the perspective of a, of a business owner. So I remember reading the fucking head back in high school and just remembering, you know, the whole optimism versus, you know, being selfish and I really thought work was right. And, you know, and then now, you know, many years after college and this is our APR in business and I have a few employees that work closely with us who are starting to see our success because they work basically from our home office, yeah. so they can see maybe some material things you may acquire, or vacation, so they can see things. But, you know, they haven't been with us for eight years. They come and go, they might have just worked for a few months or, uh, or a year, but based on speaking with them, I can tell the mindset from their perspective as a 27 year old with college degrees, with parents who put them through or, you know, they're middle class kids. Yeah. I'm kind of afraid of how they think because they're the next generation and they really do buy what they're hearing from media and what they've been taught in school, which is that anyone who has money is kind of like, you know, like bad or like, you know, like taking from them, taking their productivity yeah. and achieving success on their, on their backs. backs. Right. No, and this is an old story. It's just I think this generation is more infected with this than the previous, just because it keeps intensifying. But my mother told me seriously when I was growing up that anybody who's a millionaire is a crook. I mean, you can't make a million dollars unless you cheat lights. You know, that's the only way to make it. You know, it, it took me a while to figure out that it's the reverse. Right? It's very hard to make a million dollars if you're lying, cheating, and stealing. Um, but yes, I mean. It, we, we're growing up in an age, I may call it the age of envy. And there's definitely an age of envy, but think about the small code. Because think about a moral code that says that a person's moral responsibility is to serve others, to live for others, to give to others. And you're poor and you're young, you're the other. You're expecting people to give to you because you're this other. You don't have anything to give. And yet, here's your boss, and he's not giving you as much. So, you know, there's a real conflict there. There's envy. Envy is a product of this morality. It necessitates envy. So, 
I, I hate you, I resent you because your moral responsibility, your moral duty is to make my life better. Not to make your life better, make my life better. And when I have a lot, it'll be my moral responsibility to help somebody else. But that's that's a whole setup. And once you present that setup, anybody who doesn't have stuff, and there's always somebody who doesn't have relative to wealthy people, is going to resent the wealthy. The more statist we become, the more you know, selfless we become, the more altruistic we become, the more envy and resentment and hatred of the rich you will have. And you see this a lot more in Europe than you do in America. Because America is still a land of individualism. It's still you make yourself, you build it, you create it, although you don't build it anymore, right? Obama <laughs> said you didn't build it. So we're, we're becoming like Europe. But in Europe, in Europe, rich people, some rich people in some countries, they won't drive fancy cars. Because, because people so resent it, are so antagonistic towards wealth, that the, the, the wealthy are very fearful. Um, you see that in Scandinavian countries, you know, and it's why they're willing to accept higher taxes and more of an equalization, it's because they literally fear other people, because it's at, su at such a level. Uh, and in a social life, if somebody has let, you know, you're chided for showing off your wealth, or for being too ostentatious, there's a little bit of that here, right, in, in the U.S., but less, to so, less than in Europe. You know, I can't prove this, and I don't know if this is true. You know, Stephen, I don't know if you know Stephen Cohen, the hedge fund guy in, in New York, one of the big billionaires, and his hedge fund was just forced to close because of supposed insider trading. It's a very broad definition of insider trading they have these days. Stephen Cohen is known for being extravagant, ostentatious, he'd be criticized in the media, he'd be criticized <laughs> by people all over the place for, for being that type of person. His practices are not that different than many other hedge funds, but he's the one they chose to go after. Um, these things drive, so what's the next hedge fund guy gonna do? He's gonna hide it. He's not gonna buy the $500 million painting or whatever it was that, you know, he did because they're fearful, and that's a sad state of the world when, when you you fe you fear, you know, the product of your own achievement. It's 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 very sad. Yeah. What would your advice be to uh, someone like Michael Milken, you know, like a modern day person? I know you like to talk about it and to say yeah. that he defended himself unwisely by talking about how much he gave to charity. How should these people defend themselves? Well, Michael Milken, I mean, personally, Michael Milken is one of my heroes. I think, I think he's a, he, was, he was an amazing, amazing financier. Uh, if you study the history of American business in the 70s and 80s, I think he had a, a crucial role in restructuring American business and making it a lot more productive than it had been and really changing the face of both finance, but really of business itself. And then if you look at the companies he financed, I don't know how many of you know Michael Milken, but you know, every every early technology uh, in, in a telecommunication stage was financed by his by by Drexel Burns and his company through the use of what they called junk bonds. So whether it was across cellular, for cellular company, it was cable company. All the telecommunication industry was funded originally with these with these bonds that then became called junk bonds. And, and really, by the way, it's a huge market today. People don't they call them high yield bonds today. But in those days, and he went to jail. He was, he, you know, he, he, there was an effort to go after this guy and to, to destroy him. And it was a concentrated effort. It, it, was, it was led by Giuliani. Uh, Giuliani built his political career after going after Michael Milken. And it, in the end, they cut a deal with him uh, where he pleaded guilty to 10, 10 things. 10 things that if it were anybody else, they would have got a slap on the wrist and they would have been a little fine and sent home. Uh, he got in front of the judge and he, you know, and he gave his whole spiel about how much he gives to this research and that charity and this charity and that charity. And then the judge said, we're going to make an example of you. You got 10 years in jail, 10 years in jail for, for trivial stuff. Um, and, you know, what I would have done is not cut a deal. And the reason, by the way, he cut a deal, supposedly, is, is they were going after his family. They were going after everybody. I mean, this is, this, these are mafia tactics that the Justice Department engages in when they go after businessmen, in my view. They were using, you know, in the 80s, they started using RICO. RICO was passed. RICO is a, is, a, is a piece of legislation passed to go after organized crime. And the idea with RICO is you freeze the assets because with organized crime, 
If you don't freeze the asset and you go after it, they, they, they move the assets out of your REIT. Today, they use RICO on anything. They, they freeze assets. There was just a court case recently where the judge threw it out because they, 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 the Justice Department froze assets. Um, you know, they accused, I can't remember what they accused them, some stock manipulation or something, and they, they, they use this on financiers more than anybody else on, on business, basically. The same tactics they use on, on uh, organized crime. I would have not cut a deal. I would have stood up and argued the merits of the case. I would have gone to trial. I think he would have won on the merits of the case. I don't think he did anything wrong. Even the things that he admitted to, I don't think he did. Um, and I would have been incredibly proud of his achievements. I mean, it's, it, if you, it's hard to place yourself in 1989 and look back on the 10, 15 years of his career and how much that guy achieved, how much he changed the world in a, for the better in, in real deep, significant ways. Uh, and he was banned from the financial industry for life. And, you know, he could have had, a, a, he was still young. He was still, I think, in his early 40s. So he, he had a whole career in front of him still, and he was banned. Um, Dr. Dr. Brick, can yeah. I supplement something that you just, sure. you just said? Um, it's often forgot, I was, I don't know how, how old you are, but I was uh, I was of an age when Milton was being, you know, uh, run out of town on a rail. I was here at UT. Uh, oh, really? Getting, finishing my MBA. It's often forgotten that Milton started out uh, in a scholarly way. He started out, you, you might know this, yeah. but he started out with a scholarly analysis of the, of the historical performance of bonds. Absolutely. And he looked and he saw that bonds that had a high risk premium actually wound up with a better total return. So he was on completely good right. factual grounds. This is, nobody remembers this. Nobody remembers that he actually had an academic background. Yep. He did, and he was hired because of the paper he wrote about that, and he yep. traded, and he made money. And they kept giving him more and more money. Was and he nasty. turned Drexel Burnham, which was a third-rate small investor bank. When it went bankrupt, Drexel Burnham was the biggest investment bank on Wall Street. Bigger than, at the time, Merrill Lynch and Solomon Brothers and Goldman Sachs and all of these guys. And you can tell the whole story of why they went bankrupt and what drove them to that. But that's way beyond. The point is, he should have been proud. He should have stood up. And he should have defended himself on the facts and on his record. And his record in business, not his record in charity. Uh, so you started your talk with sort of a drawing a distinction between what an athlete does sort of on the conceptual level and what a businessman CEO does, mm -hmm. which is sort of more conceptual. And I think that's a you know that's true. But I think on, with some reflection, folks can see that uh, all right, I really couldn't be Bill Gates. It's complex. It's building software. It's you know running this huge multinational corporation. Um, you look at sort of some of the more recent anti-capitalist movements, for example, like. Uh, Occupy Wall Street, and when they were on the street, they weren't saying down with Microsoft, down with you know, well, maybe sometimes, but uh, down with General Motors. Things that people that make values that are like obviously you know out there in the world. They're saying it's the bankers, it's the sure. secondary markets, and you know secondary security markets and things sure. like that. Can you address uh, how those uh, kind of financial uh, uh, services companies are? Do create value in our, you know, I'm not an occupy Wall Street. No, no, <laughs> it's a great question, and it's absolutely, it's exactly, I think it reinforces my point. So, the most perceptual level is the athlete, and you get that. At the next step, there's, a, there's Microsoft, right? I use a Microsoft product, okay, I get that. But then there's the banker, <laughs> who I would argue makes it possible for Microsoft to exist makes it possible for Microsoft to make the product that you benefit from, but is in the background, is in the shadows. I would even argue it makes it possible for LeBron James to make $50 million. There wouldn't be a building, there wouldn't be any of that stuff without the bank in the background, funding it, providing the capital, and so on. So the more perceptual, the easier it is for people to comprehend, the more abstract, finance being the most abstract of all of these, the more difficult it is for them to comprehend the value of but my view is, and this is not, this is not based on the fact that my PhD is in finance, but I, I think that I'm not biased. That is also a, the levels of the value added. The bank adds the most value. Because if you think about what the role of financial markets and institutions is, the role of financial markets and institutions is, is to allocate capital on an economy-wide, on a region-wide basis. It's not just one company. It's the fact that I'm choosing Microsoft over 
you know, what was the previous, you know, the, the, the I'm choosing GM over the buggies. <laughs> because think about it, it's not the customers that chose the GM over the buggies initially. It was somebody had to finance Ford in order to build automobiles because they believed in automobiles. And by doing that, usually at the same time, defunding the buggy industry, right? Not letting them expand, letting them work, and then the customers get it, right? So at a macro level, nobody does more to allocate resources, allocate resources than the bank industry. They make Bill Gates possible. They, and and that's, that's true of venture, but it also when he grows, he takes bank loans, he goes public, he needs Goldman Sachs to, you know, to underwrite it. He needs to control his risk. So he needs derivatives, swaps, whatever the type of derivatives that he might engage in. All of these things are what make possible for these businesses to grow and expand. But think about a bank saying, because, you know, when they're good, right? They have this kind of hilltop view and saying, no, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna invest in this industry. Think about the stock market, right? Stocks going down. What does that represent? Bad future prospects. This industry, good future prospects. The bond market does the same thing. Bankers do the same thing. So they're making the decision. And that's at a macro level. At an individual level, you know, J.P. Morgan used to say when, when he was in front of Congress, uh, they brought him to heckle him and to abuse him, just like they do today. And this was 1913. And he was asked, you know, the financial statements and all this stuff that he needs in order to decide a loan, because they were trying to show his corrupt. And he said, I don't, need, I don't look at financial statements. I, I, there's only one criteria by which I decide who to loan money to and who don't. And the congressman asked him, what is that? And he said, character. I lend to people with character, and I don't lend to people without character. And that you can't capture in a balance sheet. So the decision of which businessmen to support, which businessmen not support. I'm sure there were other people trying to do with Bill Gates that didn't get the money to do it, didn't get the venture capital. The guy who gave Apple the first check. You know, Steve Jobs stunk, literally stunk. He had long hair, he didn't believe in showering. We he didn't believe in showering. I mean, the guy was a, and yet somebody believed in him. And it, this is not an exit, because the same guy who gave Steve Jobs his first check turned out is the same guy who gave Cisco their first money, and Yahoo their first money, and Google their first money. So these are these are smart guys. These do know what they're doing, and they, they're evaluating something that we mere mortals don't do. <laughs> can do, right? So if we explain it right, and it's harder because it's more abstract, then not only I look at at a, at a Steve Jobs, and I don't know how to do what he does, but then I look at the bank and I say, I really don't know what he does. And JP Morgan would be my example. The problem with banking today. And this is why the Occupy movement had some element of legitimacy, right? Some little fraction. Is that government and banking are so interwound today. It's so much cronyism in banking today. It's the most crony of all industries. Well, I mean, when you see a chairman of Goldman Sachs after chairman of Goldman Sachs after chairman of Goldman Sachs becoming a Treasury Department, right? Secretary of the Treasury. And then you see Lehman going bust, but AIG being bailed out, and the counterparty in AIG is all Goldman Sachs, right? And you say, were they bailing out AIG to save Goldman Sachs? And whether you believe that or not, whether it's true, I don't know the, 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 what exactly you know, the, the numbers would have been, but it looks like Goldman Sachs being bailed out, the competitor Lehman is being allowed to go, that all this is being manipulated, that all these guys are in each other's pockets, when Rubin was chairman of Goldman Sachs, then he goes and becomes treasury secretary, then he's, then he's chairman of Citibank. It's all this, you know, cabal looks like. That is upsetting, and that's legitimately upsetting. But then you have to ask the question of where does cronyism come from? And my argument is cronyism comes from government, right? Government says, we want to regulate X. And what are the businessmen going to do? Say, okay, fine, do whatever you want no, they're going to say, no, don't regulate us. And if you do regulate us, here's some better ways to do it versus worse ways to do it. And, oh, by the way, now that you're regulating us, could you regulate those other guys as well? That's how it happens. And Microsoft, again, Microsoft's a great example of a lot of things. In, uh, before the Justice Department went after Microsoft, in the early 1990s, how much money did Microsoft spend on lobbying? Exactly zero dollars. Nothing. 
They were brought in front of Congress. Senator Arn Hatch, the Republican, brought them in front of Congress, and they were lamb blasted for not lobbying. <laughs> <laughs> you need to give us our, you know, yeah. our bill. Guess what? The Justice Department goes after them. And by the way, one of the things that they were accused of, you don't have corporate headquarters, you don't have a significant facility in D.C. Okay. <laughs> so we don't need one. Yes, you do, right? Now, they spend tens of millions of dollars a year lobbying. They have a beautiful building in D.C. where they have, they've got, I've spoken in the Microsoft building in D.C., beautiful facilities, wonderful place. Um, they lobby extensively because they learned the lesson. Justin Tomorrow went after them. And do they sometimes lobby to stop Google from doing something? Yeah. Once you get into that game, it gets distorted, it gets perverted, and you do ugly things. But it's the game gets initiated with the guy with a gun. So the way to stop cronyism is to get government out of the economy, is to prevent government from intervening in the economy. That's how you get rid of it. Not don't blame businessmen for lobbying. Blame the government for regulating the business to begin with. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Um, my question is actually more about, I guess, the future with, with um, I guess, the general trend of, of what you're talking about. Um, given, I guess, the the recent, I mean, not even recent, but ju just the general trend towards statism, especially in the United States, at what point does it stop being profitable or even worth it for businessmen to undergo, I guess, the, the struggle that you're talking about? The, what, at what point is it worth it, really, if I, if I can draw into Atlas Shrugs? Go to the strike. It's, uh, yeah, I know. Yeah, pretty much. At what point is it worth it for someone like, you know, say, Hank Green to stop being Hank Green and start being Hank Well, I mean, it's, it's a, every businessman makes that decision for himself, but it, I found it interesting for the first time, I think, in American history, maybe this happened earlier. In 2009, 10, in 8, 9, 10, you heard a lot of stories about people retiring early, slowing down, stopping to work as hard, and not because they couldn't or they couldn't make money, but because they felt oppressed. And there's a whole term that was out there called going galt, you know, named after Atlas Shrugged. So it was the idea of I'm going galt, which means I'm a toy. I'm not going to work as hard. You, you want to tax me? Fine, but I'm just not going to work as hard. So the whole attitude of I'm withdrawing from society w was present. Now, you know, I don't think that's, that prevalent, I don't think that's but it, it keeps getting worse. And, and you go to Europe and there are lots of businessmen working really hard. So I don't think that's what's gonna bring everything you know down. Businessmen are gonna disappear like they do in Atlas. Uh, you know, I, I think that just we're already we're experiencing much slower economic growth than we have historically. Uh, there's no reason to think that's gonna change. It, it could get a lot worse in the future. I think we're more likely to just shrink out of inertia than we are because businessmen stop. Because I don't think they they committed to, to their own lives in, a, in, in that deep sense to cause them to stop. Mm -hmm. Plus, business is fun. They enjoy it. They, they, they really, they live it. Um, so at, at least six uh, CEOs of um, tech companies that are successful have dropped out of college or dropped out of grad school. And, um, However, there's this uh, perception in America that you need a degree to be successful. Um, so there's this big bubble in education. Um, and I'm curious about the source of that. If, if it's because of government subsidies or... So you're curious about the source of the idea or the source of the bubble? Um, <laughs> both. I mean, I, they have to be... I guess so. well, the, the idea is actually <laughs> empirically true. So the fact, if you look at income over the last 20, 30 years, and you look at people with a college degree, independent of what that degree is in, and without a college degree, if you don't have a college degree average, now this is, this is on average, those six suddenly are above average, um, income is stagnant for people without a college degree, and income is rising for people with a college degree over the last 30 years. So this, this seems to be an educational premium um, in the marketplace. For people now, whether that's self-selection, people who go to college would have succeeded anyway because they, they selected to go to college. There's a lot of things you can say about the study, but empirically, on its face, it looks like getting a degree pays, and not getting a degree doesn't. The six you mentioned and people like that would have been successful no matter what they would have done. I mean, they're just extraordinary human beings. Um, the problem, I think, with with 
this is once you break it out by type of degree, it makes a big difference what you get a degree in. Right? Uh, if you're getting a degree in the humanities, your income rises, but at a much slower rate than if you get a degree in, in, in engineering or in, even in business. So the more skill-oriented, now that wasn't the case historically. Historically, humanities paid off because Wall Street hired humanities graduates and others. But it's changing. It seems to be changing. We don't know this, but it seems to be changing. The, the, the skills you're learning in humanities are less valuable. I think it has to do with what they're teaching over there. And the quality of the teaching and the quality of the research and the quality of the thinking in the humanities departments, that's what's causing this. But now, the bubble, the two bubbles, one is the number of people going to college, and the second is the cost of college. Now, the cost of college to me, the bubble is caused by government. Whenever the government gets into something and subsidizes it dramatically, you get a bubble in it. You've got a bubble in Healthcare, healthcare costs that go through the roof. People say, why are healthcare costs going up? It's because of technology. In every other industry, when you introduce technology, costs go up, right? <laughs> no, they go down, right? Um, LASIK. LASIK, the government doesn't pay for LASIK. Medicare, Medicaid doesn't cover LASIK. Guess what the cost of LASIK has been? Down. Right? So, 51 cents of every dollar spent in America on healthcare is paid for by government. Medicare, Medicaid primarily, but other programs as well. So the more money they spend on it, the higher the cost of health care is going to be. This, and with Obamacare, it's just going to go up even faster, not slower. Uh, so education is being subsidized heavily, heavily, and therefore it's going up. And of course, this is all, just like with health care, this is, this, in some sense, the left doesn't care because this is all leading to what? What's the way to solve the education bubble? Make it free. Absolutely. There's no bubble in uh, in the UK in education. There's no bubble in Europe in education because the state pays for it all. Right? So you don't see the price. You just pay the 2,000 participation and the state covers the rest and you never see it. There's no, there's no rising health care costs in Europe. Because once you socialize it all, once you nationalize all of it, you hide the real costs. You hide it. You know, you can see the cost going up in the private sector of healthcare in the United States. What about Medicaid? Are the costs going up in Medicaid? Yeah, but it's hidden because nobody actually has to write a check. Right? You go, you get your hip replaced, you're 80 years old, you get your hip replaced, and the government wrote the check. You didn't write a check. Nobody sees the rising cost of healthcare. So it's all leading to, to some kind of nationalization, whether it's free education or free healthcare. I mean, free, there's no free. But, you know, uh, so that's the bubble. Now, whether you know Peter Thiel, I don't know if you know Peter Thiel, the, the, one of the founders of PayPal, um, who's very active in the world out there. He pays kids not to go to college. If you've got an idea to start a business and you commit not to go into college, he'll give you hundred thousand dollars, right, to start that business. You know, and he's on this anti-go to college bit. Of course, he lectures at Stanford all the time. <laughs> um, I have to ask him sometime why he does that. So there's, there's definitely this idea that college is more and more of a waste of time. And what you'll see, I think the big challenge for colleges is going to be the internet, right? I, because it's not the degree that's going to count in the future. What's going to count in the future, and what counts today, at the end of the day, is your skill set. And if you can attain those skills via an online education versus a, a uh, going to a school and, have, you know, and paying tuition, <coughs> Schools are going to have to, and, they, and they're realizing that, and you're seeing trying to, attempts at adaptation. But the whole education field is going to be shaken up quite a bit in the next 20 to 30 years. Because, you know, because technology is going to disrupt it, just like it disrupts everything else. So, hopefully I answered that question. I just wanted to continue on that. And I guess what I always thought of when, in terms of the education field is that not so much, because, you know, you always, they always say, like, the stuff you learn in class isn't is going to prepare you like the job doesn't exist. What is the what is the saying? Okay, sorry. <laughs> so the it's not going to prepare you for a particular job, but it's going to give you the skills to take any job. Yeah. Something so like the that. skills that you learn today in class, like, are for jobs that aren't going to exist that that haven't been created yet. And so what I thought, like, what I always felt education was was that. You're proving that you have the ability to learn, 
as opposed to like learning a skill set that they're going to use you, because the things that you're you, that you're learning in school right now might not be applicable when you get out. And so the process of going to school and learning is proving that you can learn and acquire these skills and then weed out the people who can. I think there's a lot of truth to that. I think employers view it that way. They look at you and say, A, if you could get accepted to UT, you must be smart. B, if you did well at UT, you might be smart, you can learn it, you can adapt it, you can do all these things. So therefore, you're qualified. The question is what happens if they find other tools to measure the same thing, right? And you're seeing that more and more. In Silicon Valley today, having a college degree has is, is become less and less and less important for hiring, not just for the entrepreneurs who start the company, but even for hiring decisions. So you're, I know people at Apple who will say, it used to be we only hired college grads. But today, they're getting resumes from 18, 19 year olds who've already built a website, started a little business, done this, done that, and they've proven their ability already, so it's less. The question is this, the question is, and the other question is, when Stanford only gives A's and B's, <coughs> have you proven that you can learn? Because at Stanford, it's very hard to get a C, a D, or an F. I don't know what it's like at UT, but when I was teaching, you know, failing was a huge deal, and you had to really work hard to justify failing somebody in a class. Right? You know, students would get very upset. They would go and other faculty, you know, this wasn't politically correct to fail people. And it, but, but, it's, but the better the school, the more great inflation there is. At least that's what I've seen. At Stanford is known for almost everybody gets A's and B's. So what are you actually measuring? And then, if what you're studying in the humanities is garbage, which I taught in the humanities is garbage, Wrong history, wrong philosophy, but not just wrong, but not giving you tools to think. Because what the human historically, the humanities was a great training ground for thinking, for giving you a broad knowledge of the world. You know about history, you know about society, you know about human behavior, and the tools about how to think about it. But if the humanities don't believe in thinking, we don't believe thinking is rationality is a, is a good thing, right? or whatever, then you start questioning whether those degrees are worth are really doing the filtering that you talked about. So, and I think the world is coming, trying to come to grips with these things. Figure that out. And you're seeing a restructuring in the education field. And you see, you see these bubbles. I'll, I'll give you an example of a, I mean, law schools went through a bubble. And that's why law schools right now are shrinking all over the country. You're seeing law schools. It's one of the few you know, universities where they're finding tenured professors in some places because they just don't have enough, they're not admitting enough students because they can't find their graduates' jobs. So law schools are actually shrinking. And, you know, that might happen elsewhere. How bad will the economy get before it gets better? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, there's a false assumption. You're assuming it gets better. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, People always tell me, things will get so bad, everybody will wake up and they'll realize this is so bad. I mean, where's the historical evidence that that ever happens? I mean, usually when things, I mean, talk about really bad. When things get really bad, what do people usually want? Some leader will tell them how to behave and what to do and how to, you know, some authoritarian figure. Human history is full of examples of economies collapsing and authoritarianism on the rise. Uh, and I think we're, you know, I don't think America is ready for authoritarianism, but you can, it's inching in that direction. The, the, the central government has more and more power. We saw it a little bit with Bush after 9-11. We were willing to treat him, you know, as if he, he could do a no wrong, you know. And, you know, with Obama over there, and they say, it's not just what they're doing, it's that we're not upset about it. It's like, okay, so they're listening to everything I say. Who okay. cares? <laughs> you shouldn't care. You should care. It's not anybody's business. They shouldn't be listening to you. Right? I've always assumed it, so it didn't upset me that much because I've always assumed they were listening to me. But that's because I'm a cynic. Um, <laughs> but it's, so, I think it, America's, the mentality of America is becoming more and more acceptable to authoritarianism, but we're still far away from reaching that. Also, you know, economic, good economic theory doesn't come to you because things are bad. Sometimes it does. You had the Thatcher. Yeah, the 70s, and there was a real correction after the 70s, people got it, and you got that generation coming about, and there was a real global correction, and things got much better. 
Uh, it, but I don't see a way in a factor of it. Right? Uh, and I don't see the you know, I don't see the momentum building towards a real shift. We'll, we'll see. I hope I'm wrong, but, but we'll see. How much, you know, the economy could get a lot worse. I mean, you know, I think we're distorting the economy right now quite dramatically with what the Fed's doing. Um, I think government spending's out of control. I think we haven't started feeling the truth. You know, people talk about we're running $17 trillion deficits, but the real deficit is the unfunded liabilities of Medicare and Medicaid. Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, dominant that Social Security is small. But the unfunded liability debt, depending on who you read, is anywhere from 70 to $210 trillion. $200 trillion is by far more than the GDP of the entire world. And that's present value future liability, right? Net, right? So you either have to cut, you're going to have to dramatically cut healthcare costs in the future to, to people who retire. And the baby boom generation is going to get lousy healthcare as they get older, or something's going to have to give, or the economy's going to have to grow with 10% GDP growth, which is unheard of. So uh, in the next 20 years, there's a reckoning, right? You're going to have to do something different to fix what's, what's going on. And it's on your guy's back, right? It's, it, it's young people's back, right? It's, you know, if you're 75, times are good, right? You're getting the best health care in the world, and it costs you nothing. And for every dollar you put in a Medicare, it makes you feel good because you, you put dollars in. They were spent a long time ago, but you put it in. For every dollar you put into Medicare, you'll spend four. Four. So that means your kids and grandkids need to be taxed at four times greater than what you were taxed to be able to, to, be able to afford you your health. Right? But there's still money, so they'll, they'll benefit from it. But it's the young people. Who, I mean, you guys should be unbelievably resentful. You should be, you know, in the 1960s, young people went into the streets, right? They rioted, they demonstrated, they, they occupied buildings on thing. And for, you know, they went overboard, but the cause was basically a good cause. A stupid war that we were fighting and a draft that forced them to go and die in some godforsaken part of the world that they had no interest in. And America, in my view, had no interest in it. Should not, that was not a war. America should have been fighting. And they went and they, they did something about it. You're in much worse shape. Much worse shape. I mean, you're enhancing an economy that is barely growing. You guys are going to have a very hard time finding jobs. Uh, when you get those jobs, real income growth is very moderate. It's compared to past generations where income growth was dramatically increasing. And you are each, I think, I can't remember the debt levels that you've each one just by being born and inherited from. And, and think about this, the greatest generation, the World War II generation, the baby boom generation, these two generations have left you with, a, with $200 trillion of debt. You, they don't work anymore. They retire, they're living a good life, supposedly. You guys are gonna have to pay off the $200 trillion. And you won't be able to. And your standard living has to go down if you're paying off the debts of, of people who spent it in the past. So you should be out there in the streets demonstrating. You should be upset. You should be mad. Because this is worse than a draft. I mean, a draft is really bad. But this is worse than a draft. This is, you're basically being, you know, your future is being enslaved to paying off the debts of your parents and grandparents. Debts you didn't choose to take on. I'd be mad. <laughs> but I'm at the tail end of the baby boomers. I'm mad. Bad for a so are you just saying enslaved by the taxes that we'll see? Yeah. Well, either taxes go up, or you have inflation, or you just have slow economic growth. But no, uh, the way you look at it, this debt has to be paid somehow, either through inflated dollars or through, or through taxes. Either way, you're screwed. <laughs> so if they make changes now, you can salvage everything somehow. 20 years from now, it becomes much more difficult. The longer you wait, the more difficult it becomes. So, and the more you'll have to pay on that vote. So you want change now. So instead of Occupy going into the streets, complaining about cronyism and Wall Street, no real problem, but still, what you should be occupying the streets is over, over entitlements, over the debt, over the lousy economy. And the economies can be fixed, I, you know, 
I'm arrogant, but I think it's easy. <laughs> I think the economy could blow up the US could boom. All you have to do is a few basic things. You know, deregulate, lower corporate taxes, you know, lower taxes, but mainly regulations. Get rid of all the burdens and regulations that are placed on business. And business would start investing and you'd see a boom in this economy. This is not hard. And, and this is what Reagan did, right? This is we've got this is what Thatcher did. We've got history on our side. This is not hard stuff. Oh, we're doing the opposite. And the whole world is doing yeah, at least Europe, the whole Western world is doing the opposite. Somebody who hasn't asked. Yeah. Dr. Burke, you've described two moral systems. Uh, there's sort of the one darkness, where there's shame, there's not being alive, there's not being proud of your achievement, and so on, and there's light, where you are proud of your life, and you're pursuing your, your yeah. self-interest next week. Societally, how do we get from one to the other? Uh, short of short of everybody buying out a shirt or some other... Education, interest. education, it's education. It's all about education. How do you change can happen? There are, no, there are no quick fixes, there's no magic bullet, there's, you know, this is an age-old battle, this is not new, there's a new book out. Um, but it, it really is a theme that Ayn Rand talked about and then Leonard Peikoff talked about. We, we, we basically, be, there's a battle going on in the world right now between two philosophers, and there's always been this battle going on between the same two philosophers since they wrote, and that's Plato and Aristotle. And we keep alternating, and we get the good stuff when Aristotle wins, and we get the bad stuff when Plato wins. Um, what's the name of Anybody know what the name of the book that's out right now? Why? Cave in the Light, the Cave in the Light, that's right, the cave is Plato, the light is Aristotle. Now, I, I, I think, I haven't read the book, which is based on the reviews that I've read, I think I'm going to disagree on a, a lot of what he concludes, but the fact that he's setting up all of history as the battle between these two guys is pretty amazing. Um, and again, a theme that Ayn Rand talked about years and years ago. And, uh, but it is, it's, it, it, it's, this, it's this real struggle of ideas, and there's no easy way to bridge that gap. It's about education, education, education. It's about ideas. It's about changing people's minds. And the only way to change people's <laughs> minds, I mean, we believe in reason. <laughs> the only way to change people's minds is through reason. Um, and, and, you know, the earlier you start, the younger the kids are, the better. So, you know, but it's all, that's why this is a very long-term struggle. It's not I, I was going to say that it seems, yeah, like things are not good because it's about education. I have like the world and I worry about their future. Yep. And I look at, I think I'm still born for a while, I don't talk about too much, but the problem also is with public school education and they have their own agenda. Sure. So now you got me depressed. What do you want? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, you, you look. You're absolutely right. It, it's this is a lot of work, and you got to start a public school. So there, there are good things happening. There's a there's a, a, a an objectivist who runs who owns some schools and is going national with the schools, and they're they're opening up branches all over the country. Hopefully, they're opening up their first branch in San Francisco and one in New York next year, and uh, they've got uh, five schools in Orange County in Southern California. And they want to have a hundred schools one day. So those are the kind of things that need to be happening. People need to be starting schools. People need to be investing in those kind of ventures because you have to start young. And look, everybody's against us. This is why you should be giving huge amounts of money to the Ironman Institute <laughs> because it's an enormous battle, and everybody's everybody's against us. And you know, we're talking about. How much do schools get? How much do universities get? We're talking about trillions and trillions of dollars, and we have a few million to play with. We're way outnumbered and outgunned and outspent. And, you know, they don't, but again, I, I wish I had a shortcut. If I had a shortcut, I would have done it already. But there's no, there's nothing. I mean, it's up to you guys, particularly if you're young. You need to fight for your life. Go out into, into the streets. 
you know, start speaking up, start arguing for your life. It's not about, it's, it's your right to pursue happiness. It's been taken away from you. You don't have a right to pursue happiness anymore in this country. You have a right to pay off your parents' debt. Talk about the morality of altruism. They expect you to sacrifice your life for your parents and grandparents. Now, that's evil. That's out and out evil. And you should speak up, and you should argue against it, and you should talk about it, and you should. You need to make your voices heard. And that's the only way anything changes, is people rise up and they challenge it. Go become professors and teach the arts. It, you know, that's it. It's a generational, so it's going to take a generation or two or three to change the world. But you gotta, you got to fight now. And we might fail. And we're like, you know, if you ask me what the odds are, you know, you ask me what the odds are that the economy collapses and they're much bigger than 50%. <laughs> that we don't succeed in winning. In a, you know, within the next few decades. In the next 50 years, where we have a, you know, where we turn the tide, I don't know, 10%, 20%? But if it's only, even if it's only 10%, what do you do? Just give up and pretend you're dead? You gotta keep fighting. Thank you all.